Good evening. Happy Tuesday. I want to um, <clears throat> want to say that my, what my brother had to share this, this evening was very encouraging. I appreciate that testimony. And yeah, amen. And I want to say that also <clears throat> that um, I appreciate being around you. Some of you I had a chance to hang out with you. Hopefully I get a chance to spend some time with a lot more of you. And so um, I believe we're going to try to make that available. So please, I, I would love to get a chance. I've met some of you. I really want to get a chance to talk with you. Um, as well, outside of just being here. Tonight's message is one that I believe is the most important message that we're going to have this weekend up to this point. And it's not simply because of the idea that we're talking about this tonight. But I really believe that if we don't understand this talk, if we don't understand this message, then everything else we're going to talk about afterwards is like null and void. This is so important. Now, we're going to be using our Bibles tonight. I hope you brought your Bible, but I can guarantee you, you will not regret it. I can promise you, you will not regret it. We're going to be looking through the Bible, but I don't think you'll regret it. All right, so will you be praying, and I'll be praying as well. Let's go ahead and bow our heads for a word of prayer. Our message, our talk tonight is how to have that faith that pleases God. How to have that faith that pleases God. Let us pray. Would you just bow your heads? Our loving Father in heaven, Lord, I want to thank you for Jesus. Lord, I, th I pray that Jesus will be seen. I pray that we would learn to trust Jesus, not ourselves. And I pray that our love for Jesus would grow. Lord, be with us as we look at our topic tonight. I ask that your angels would be by our sides. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you have your Bible, go with me to Luke chapter 18. We're going to go to Luke chapter 18, and I want to share with you a parable in Luke chapter 18, I believe as I look at this parable that this is an end-time parable. And you say, well, why is this an end-time parable? You've probably never read it in the sense of being an end-time parable. But as I read it, I was like, wow, this is an end-time parable. This parable applies to us, I believe, even more so than it applied to people in Jesus' day. Now, how do I know that? You know, first of all, when you look at this parable, Jesus connects it with his second coming. Wait a minute, that's, that's kind of like getting to, I believe Jesus is soon to come. So Jesus connects this parable with his second coming. Also, what we find about this parable, and this parable we're talking about, is a parable with the, the widow, and she's praying for, for, for the judge to venture her of her adversary. Anyone remember that, that parable? You're familiar with that parable? When she's praying, does the judge answer her? Not right away. And so she's praying and she's persistent, but yet she's praying for her judge. She has an adversary and she's praying for, to a judge who it seems like he's not hearing her. Do you recognize that you and I, are, if we are, if we are around till Jesus comes, we're going to go through that experience? Do you realize that we're going to have to know how to pray? We're going to have adversaries about us, surrounding us, and we're going to be praying. And it might seem like, where is God? This is an end time parable. But I want us to see something about this parable. This parable is very, very important to Jesus. Notice what it says, uh, Luke chapter 18, beginning in verse 1. It says, and he spake a parable. By the way, I love this because Jesus didn't often tell people this is what the parable is about and then tell the parable. But he does that with this parable. He says, and he spake a parable unto them to this end, for this purpose, that men ought always to pray and not to faint. And we know the story. It says, saying, there was a, a, in a city a judge which feared not God, neither regarded man. And there was a widow in that city, and she came unto him, saying, Venge me of mine adversary. And he would not for a while, but afterward he said, said within himself, Though I fear not God, nor regard man, I don't have to answer to anyone. Yet because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. And the Bible says, And the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge saith. And shall not God avenge his own elect which cried day and night unto him? Though he bear long with them, I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. That's the entire parable. Jesus says, listen, I want you to understand that this, prayer, this, this parable is about you need to pray. Don't give up praying. Don't faint from praying. Endure in your prayer. And Jesus gets to the end. He says, listen, understand that even though this judge, he didn't want to answer her prayer, but I will answer you speedily. But then he says something that's very, very interesting. Notice what he says next. He says, nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find what, everyone? 
faith on the earth. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? And as I pondered this parable, I really thought about this parable. If this parable applies to us in our day, we have to ask the question, why is it that Jesus is going to come and say, look, will I find faith on the earth? And one of the things I want us to understand if we understand the parable, it says that, this, that we ought to pray and not faint. The reason that many people are going to lose faith is not because they never pray. It's because they quit praying. So that what is, what is seen or, or the enduring of faith is seen by the persistency in pursuing God. And there's going to be many people in the last days who, who are just going to sit, they'll be distracted. All these things will happen, and they will quit pursuing God. And that is why Jesus is going to come and say, look, will I find faith on the earth? Faith is such an important subject. It's so foundational. And yet we as Christians, we can want to talk about this and talk about that and do all these different things. And God is like, listen, when I come back, I'm looking for, are you faithful? Are you faithful? Go with me in your Bible to Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews chapter 5. We're going to look at the importance of faith. Go with me in your Bible. We're going to Hebrews chapter 5. And while we're going there, I want to ask you a question. I want you to think tonight. Can someone tell me who was the closest disciple to Jesus? John. All right. You guys are good Bible students. John was the closest disciple to Jesus. Have you ever thought about what made John close to Jesus? He was transformed by his grace. John made some efforts. But you know what's something that's really, really interesting? If you take the book of John, books of John, there's two things I find very fascinating, and I believe those are the two keys to why John pursued Jesus and allowed the grace to transform him. Two things John often harps on is the love of Jesus, number one. Behold what manner of love the Father bestowed, that we should be called the sons of God. He beheld it, he was drawn to it, and it transformed him. The second thing you'll notice in the book of John, the gospel of John, is that over and over again, the book of John has this reoccurring word, believe. That's how important. And we look at them and say, well, how did John get so close to Jesus? Number one, he beheld his love and he believed it. You want to get close to Jesus? Behold his love and believe it. Notice what the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 5. We're going to look at how foundational faith is. Look at verse 12. The Bible says this. For when for a time ye ought to be teachers, Paul is speaking. He said the people were dull of hearing. These are the Hebrews. They're supposed to have known Jesus. He says, for when for a time ye ought to be teachers, ye have, one need, ye have need that one teach you again. Are you supposed to be a teacher tonight? Are you going to teach the gospel to the world? Or do we need someone to teach us again? Notice what it says. It says, uh, continuing, it says, you need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the sayings, that's the word oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. Now, notice what it says. We're going to skip down to verse, uh, chapter 6, verse 1. So we're looking at what were the first principles of God. We're dealing with this idea of faith. Chapter 6, verse 1. It says, therefore, leaving the principles, we're still in the context of these first principles, of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on into perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of what, everyone? And of faith toward God. Now, you see why I said I believe that tonight's message is going to be one of the most important messages because it's very foundational. If we're talking about knowing God and we're talking about let's pursue and know God, but we don't understand faith, you're not going to really know God. So this is very, very foundational. What I want to share with you tonight are Bible principles. I want to share with you five of them. Simple five Bible principles as I study what faith really is, to simplify it, Lord, what is faith? I want to share with you what I've learned. Five principles in the Bible about what faith is, how can we obtain it? And I can tell you, it's been changing my life. Notice I said changing. It's been changing my life. First thing I want to share with you, principle number one. Many people say, how do we develop faith? The principle number one is that faith is given by God, and it's our role to use it. It has to be increased. If you have your Bible, go with me to John, Luke chapter 17. Luke chapter 17. I told you we're going to use our Bibles tonight. Luke chapter 17. We find a, a story here, and we're going to look at Luke chapter 17, and look at verse 5 and 6. Are we there? All right, notice what the Bible says. Luke 17, and we're looking at verse 5. And verse 6, 
And the Bible says, And the apostle said unto, unto the Lord, Increase our faith. And the Lord said, If ye had faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye might say unto this sycamore tree, Be thou plucked up and rooted uh, by the root, and be thou planted in the sea, and it should obey you. So here God says, listen, if you just have a little faith, use it. It will increase. And the Bible tells us that God has given us a measure of faith. And even though in the context of that passage, it's actually talking about gifts. God has given us measures of faith. We've seen in the gifts that God gives to the church. But I really, I really believe that it's true for us in general. When God created man, God gave us the ability to believe. You say, well, how do we see that? Let's look at Adam and Eve. You know, the Bible actually tells us that um, we must believe that the worlds were framed frame into existence. Yes or no? Why must we believe it? Have you, did you see God create anything? Absolutely not. So you have to believe it. And we have good reason to believe it. I have some of my brothers in here say they, they're into like science and into how to see all the, the, uh, the fact that science shows there's an intelligent designer, right? There is reason to believe. We're going to talk about that. But when we look at this, we have to believe that God created. Now check this out. Did Adam see God create anything? Did Adam and Eve see God create anything? Absolutely not. Did Adam see God create Eve? God put them into a deep sleep. So when Adam and Eve accepted the fact that God created, was it because they saw it or because they heard his word and he said, look, this, they heard what Jesus said about it. They heard what God said. They had to accept it by faith. You and I also have been given a measure of faith. Men have been given a measure of faith, but it's how we use it. You know, a lot of times we use faith and we trust ourselves. A lot of times we take faith and we trust what experts say. We trust what other men can do for us. God, the first thing we understand is that God has given us a measure of faith, but our job is to increase it with use. Notice what else the Bible says about it. Go with me to the book of Romans chapter 14. Romans chapter, I'm sorry, Romans chapter 10. Go with me to Romans chapter 10. Principle number one, we've been given a measure of faith. We just have to use it. Romans chapter 10. Notice what the Bible says. And we're going to look at verse, specifically for the sake of time, let's look at verse 17. Romans 10, 17. We should be familiar with this text. The Bible is actually talking about the preaching of the word of God. How can they hear without a preacher? But the Bible says this in verse 17. So then faith cometh by what, everyone? By hearing and hearing by the word of God. How do I increase my faith? I have to be spending time in God's word, I have to be accepting the promise, and I have to be using it. That's principle number one. Very simple, yes or no? So you say, well, what then is principle number two? Notice what the Bible says here. Principle number two, we have to understand that faith is reasonable. A few years ago, I actually, um, I used to like to watch debates. I don't know if, I wouldn't encourage you to do that, but I used to just kind of like to watch debates. And I watched a man by the name of, uh, uh, he's a, a world-renowned, I believe, atheist. I believe he's, we can call him a world-renowned atheist. Richard Dawkins. Anyone ever heard of him? And I watched a few debates by Richard Dawkins uh, with, with Christians. And he would always get to this point, at least the one debate I was looking at. Actually, I saw two. But one debate he got into, he gets to this one point, and uh, he says, you know, and it seems like he always stumps Christians with this. You know, Christians use faith as that thing, it's, it's just blind. It's that thing that when they don't have any facts, when they can't prove their point, they just say, well, that's why we have, why we have faith. Just have faith. Just believe it. And I used to be troubled by this because I was like, why aren't any Christians saying anything about that? Like, no, faith is not blind. Faith is not just something you say, well, I can't explain it, so just have faith. It's blind. Faith requires reason. My favorite story, my favorite uh, woman character in the Bible is Sarah. You know why Sarah is my favorite woman character in the Bible? You probably said, no, I don't. But tonight, after tonight, you're going to know why. She's my favorite woman character in the Bible because of one verse in the Bible. And that verse is found in Hebrews chapter 11. Go with me to Hebrews chapter 11. There's only one verse about her, and it's in Hebrews chapter 11. Um, it's not the only verse in the Bible, but it's, in the, it's one verse in Hebrews 11. And I want you to notice something about Sarah. Let's look at Sarah's experience. We first find Sarah's experience in Genesis chapter, I believe it's in like chapter 11, I believe. <clears throat> um, maybe chapter 12, uh, somewhere around there. The Bible literally says Sarah uh, was Abraham's wife, and Sarah was what, everyone? She was barren. That means she couldn't have any children. 
Sarah was barren. Now, there's only one way they found out. They was like, well, this lady, she just, we, she can't have any children. The next chapter, God gives a promise to Abraham, and he tells Abraham, he says, he says, Abraham, I will make thee a great nation. Great nation? My wife is barren. Okay. You can tell that Abraham and, and Sarah have a problem with this, or, or they're struggling with this in their mind, because by the time they get to Genesis chapter 15, Abraham's like, okay, God, let me give you a suggestion. And he says, you know, I have this, this man in my house, Eliezer. How about, you know, he's my, my, my heir. You know, can, can we, can we kind of help this process along? God says, no, 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 no. Abraham, I'm going to make you a great nation from your seed. Okay, God, I don't know how this is going to work. I'm sure Sarah was struggling with this too. Uh, the very next chapter, Sarah's like, okay, God made you a promise, but it doesn't necessarily mean I have to be a part of this. So what does she do? She brings her, her, her servant, Hagar. This was a struggle. They were really wanting to see the, the, the promise of God fulfilled. I mean, could you imagine, you know, being a woman and you're actually giving your, your servant to your husband? She really wanted to see the, the promise of God fulfilled, but it wasn't happening. This was a struggle. And then you see, see years later, God, you know, of course, Ishmael is born, but then God goes back to, to Abraham. He says, Abraham, Sarah's going to have a son. You're going to have another son. Call his name Isaac. Abraham actually literally laughs. And in the very next chapter, something happens. <clears throat> There's three men that come to visit Abraham and Sarah. And when they're there, they're talking to Abraham, and they say, Sarah's going to have a son. Sarah starts laughing. But here's the thing that's really interesting. She doesn't laugh openly. Have you ever done that? Someone says something in your mind, you're thinking one way, but outwardly you're just like... But inwardly, you just, you're, you're, you're falling out laughing. Is this man, has he lost his mind? Sarah's laughing, but she doesn't do it openly. And then suddenly Jesus speaks. That's who was there. He says, why does Sarah laugh? She's like, wait a minute. I didn't laugh. Like, he's like, no, 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 but you did. And she realizes, how did this man read my thoughts? There's something supernatural. There's something powerful about him. And so she's like, wait a minute. And then I could imagine Sarah starts to think. I can't have a child, but this man, who they later found was God, he read my thoughts. If he can do that, and, Ab and Sarah starts to reason her mind. And you know what the Bible says about Sarah? She has this, this experience on one hand, but she has the weight of what God has said on the other hand. And the Bible says this in Hebrews chapter 11. And look at verse 11, the Bible says this. It says, through faith, also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age because she felt him faithful who had promised. Is that what the Bible says? No, no, no. It says because she judged him faithful. This was not something she says, like, you know what, faith comes because I feel it. I feel like I need to have faith. No, that's not what she had. She looked at the circumstances. She looked at the evidence of what God was able to do. And she says, look, in spite of what my circumstances are, I judge God faithful. And that was the verdict. And that was what, what faith was in her case. Faith was based on reason. You know, God gives you reasons to believe. God just doesn't ask you just to say, well, just believe me. God actually gives you reasons to believe. Well, you say, well, what are some of the reasons to believe? You know, one of the things is to hear the testimonies of others. You know, if you say like, oh, wow, God did that for that person, I believe God can do this for me too. This is what literally happened many times in the Bible. Someone was healed because it's like, wow, I'm hearing God is healing all these sicknesses. I'm a leper, but maybe he can do that for me. So testimonies of others are very, very powerful. The other way is that God gives you personal experiences. I was sharing this with the elementary school. One of the stories in my life that strengthened my faith, it was very, very, it was, it was like, it was, it was a very, very small thing probably in the minds of many of you. But let me tell you how it happened. I was actually with my, my mother and my sister. We were at the library, and we were inside the library, and, and while we were there, I had to get something out of the car. So I told my sister, I was like, hey, can I borrow your keys to the car? Now, I had my, my car keys with me as well, but we took my sister's car to the library, and she has a Chevy, she had at the time a Chevy Cavalier, if you're familiar with that. And I'm only telling you the, the car brand because, you know, it's, it's going to make sense for our story. Um, but she had a Chevy Cavalier. And if you don't know what all those are, just know they're different cars. Just, just know they're different. I had, at the time, an Oldsmobile Alero, two different cars. 
So I was like, hey, can I borrow your keys? I have these keys in my, in my, car, er, in my pocket. And I go to uh, the car, do what I had to do, go back into the library, and I'm sitting there. My sister's like, um, it was time to go, eventually, it's time to go. And she said, uh, do you have the keys? And I was like, no, I'm pretty sure I gave them back to you. And she's like, no, no, you didn't. She's like, you know, I gave them to you, I never got them back. And I was like, oh boy, hope I didn't lock them in the car. So I go out to the car, and I look inside the car, and there's the keys. The keys are in the passenger seat. Now, prior to this point, I always used to think to myself, God, I hear all these stories about people finding keys and they, or losing keys, and they pray and God finds it, or people get their keys locked in the car, and they pray and God opens the door. I was like, I don't think that ever happened. My faith was being tried. I didn't believe God was that powerful. Um, but in any case, I said, well, you know, this is the moment to try. Well, let me pray. Actually, before I prayed, I did something else. I was like, I can't believe I left the keys there. Let me see if there's a door that's open. So I went to the passenger side, tried the door, it was locked. Went to the next door, tried it, it was locked. Went to, went to all four doors, they were all locked. Then guess what I did? I said, let me try this again. So I went to the driver's door and I tried it, it was locked. I went to the next door, it was locked. I said, like, I just had to make sure maybe there was a door that was unlocked or, or God, you know, something. Sure enough, it was locked. So I was like, oh boy. But then I thought about it. Well, maybe I should pray. So I did. And so I went back in. Well, actually, I went back in. I told my sister, like, yeah, guess what? Something funny. I said, like, you know, those keys, they're locked in the car. And it's near lunchtime. And my sister probably wouldn't like it if I said this. But back then, she didn't get happy if things went wrong around lunchtime. So she wasn't too happy with me. And so I was like, um, I said, you know, the keys are locked in the car. But guess what? You know, God is in control. Let's pray. She, was, she still wasn't too happy about that. But we prayed, right? And she and my mom, they were still inside the library. I go back outside, and I'm out there. I'm like, Lord, you got to find a way. I, I just prayed, so maybe you're going to open the door. So I went around to the driver's seat. It was locked. I went around to the next door. It was locked. I did this all over again, and guess what happened? It was still locked. And I was like, Lord, I prayed. Like, you know, I thought you were going to come through. I know you're powerful. And as I'm going through this in my mind, I get impressed, and, and I have this impression, and it's like God is like, why don't you use your key? And I was thinking to myself, well, wait a minute. She has a Chevy Cavalier. I have an Alero. I'm trying to explain this to the God of heaven that <laughs> these are two different cars. But this is how God is so merciful. God says, you know, I didn't ask you what kind of car you had. I just said to use it. And, he, and in my mind, he took it a step further. It wasn't audible, but it was in my mind I was impressed. What, what is the worst that could happen? If you use it and it doesn't work, then the keys are still locked in there. If you use it and it does work, then you just got the keys out. What's the worst that can happen? I was like, yeah, this is a small test. So I took my keys, and surely enough, it went into the, the key slot. I was like, whoa, that's a step. <laughs> Let's take this next step. I begin to turn it, and the lock pop. The lock pop. I was like, I can't believe that. But you know what ended up happening? When I came to the next test that was harder, I started to believe, maybe, God, you can do something here because you remember that key door, that little small test. God gave me reasons to believe. God doesn't just ask you to believe blindly. And what we have to do is say, Holy Spirit, show me when, I'm, when God is doing something powerful for me. Help me to notice that because that's going to be the thing that helps me for the next test. Does that make sense? God gives us reasons to believe. Now, some of you say, well, I've never had an experience like that. Do you know that there's an experience all of you can have? All of you can have this experience. And it's a reason to believe God. You want to know what that is? Peter says God has given us a more sure word of prophecy. And when you have the experience of studying the Bible and seeing like, whoa, every single thing that God has said is true in prophecy, God says, yep, you know what? My word is true. You can trust me. That's something that all of us can have. So don't look up and say, well, I've never had that experience. I've never, someone else is, oh, no, 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 no. God has given something that all of us can test whether or not we can trust God. The word faith is reasonable. The third thing I want you to, to, to understand about faith is what is it that we need to believe about God? What is it that we need to believe about God? Go with me in your Bible to Hebrews chapter 11. I want to share with you, I believe, one of my favorite definitions about faith. Hebrews chapter 11. 
Notice what the Bible says here. I'm, I'm actually already there. Beginning at verse 6. Actually, it's beginning at verse 5 for context. It says, By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. I would want to have that testimony. I want all of us to have that experience and that testimony. Verse 6 says, But without faith it is impossible to please God, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. The thing I want us to share is that if we're going to believe God, then there's two things we really, really need to believe. We need to, first of all, believe that God is. Now, some of you say, like, that's easy. I go to Washita Hills. Of course I believe God exists. But I believe it's much deeper than that. Because when we're tested, a lot of times we'll say, yeah, yeah, I, I believe that God is. But, you know, we can really see whether or not we believe that God is when we're tested. What do I mean by that? Let me just say this. We must believe that God is what the Bible says he is. So the Bible says that God is all wise, then we must believe that God is all wise. If the Bible says that there's nothing impossible for God, then we must believe that nothing's impossible for God. Whatever God says he, whatever the Bible says he is, that's what God is. But you know what tends to happen in our experience? <clears throat> we're, just like, we're like, you know what? God is all wise. I, I believe that. I believe God is all wise. And then we get to that thing where we're like... Um, what school should I go to? And God is like, you should go over there. God, I don't know if that's the smartest decision. But you've got to believe that God is all wise. But we're like, well, <laughs> but in this case, I, I think that I, Lord, I don't know if that's really smart. Or God is like, you know, um, I don't think you should be in that relationship. God, let's, let's talk about this. I don't really believe that you're all wise. <laughs> Do we really believe? Oh, here's another one. God is like, listen, you know, pray to me. I, I can help you with that school bill. Lord, I have to have this money in a certain amount of time. I don't know if you can really do this. We don't believe God is all powerful. We don't believe there's nothing impossible for God. So it's easy for us to say, yeah, God exists. But when we're tested, do we still believe that God is? Do we still believe that? But the Bible doesn't just say that God is. Also, the Bible says that we must believe that God is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Go with me in your Bible to James chapter 2. James chapter 2. James chapter 2, we're going to look at verse 19. Now, I want to ask you a question. The devils believe? They do. Amen. I heard someone say it. Notice what the Bible says in verse 19. James chapter 2 and verse 19. The Bible says, Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and, and they tremble. Why do they tremble? Why do they tremble? You can think of some stories. You remember the two demoniacs? Jesus comes up on the shore and there's two demoniacs. Some, one, one account says there was one, but there were two. And they come to Jesus and, they, and, they, and as they're approaching Jesus, before Jesus stops them, he actually literally, he's powerful enough to stop them, right? And he asked in their name before all that, you remember what they said? They said, Lord, do you come to torment us before the time? Well, I think one story said torment. The other one says destroy us before the time. They believe God, but they believe that God is, has the power to destroy, that God means them harm. But the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, that we must believe that God is, that he's powerful, but he also is a rewarder, that he has your best interest in mind. And some of us, it's hard for us to believe that. Oh boy, how do I know? I can tell, this, tell you this in my own experience. I remember I used to love, love, love. I was very, very competitive in basketball. And I remember my elder was, was like, you know what? I have some things, some, some, some quotes, some Bible texts. You should really check this out. I was so competitive. I did not want to study that. I was like, nope, not me. Because if, you, if I was to do that, then that's just going to take away my fun. I, I don't want that. God, and, and it's like, God, you're, you're trying to hurt my life. <laughs> you're going to take away my pleasure. You're going to take away my fun. God comes and he says, listen, do you want to hear my counsel for your life when it comes to what you have to eat? And there's many people who's like, oh, no, 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 no. I got to have my meat. I got to have it. <laughs> no, no, no. God, you're trying to hurt me. I can't live without that. We act as though God is going to torment us 
instead of God, whatever he's coming to give us is for our good. There's a promise that's given, I believe it's in the book Education, it says, um, the promise says, education, well, education is the watch, uh, something better, sorry, something better is the watchword of education, it's the law of all true living, whatever Christ asks us to renounce, or something of that effect, he says, we place, he places in its stead something better. So even if it looks like, God, I don't know, like this is going to cramp my style, this is going to hurt my life. If we really trust that God loves us and wants what's best for our good, then we'll say, okay, I don't know what this is, but I know this is better for me. And after I receive it, because he loves me, my life is going to be happier. When you come to the point that we believe that God is, that he's all powerful, and when we believe that God wants what's best for our good, then we can really start to experience trusting God, having faith. There's two more things. I know our time is running out. But there's two more things I want to share with you. One, the, the, the fourth thing is what, is the, what are the roadblocks in us experiencing faith? I think this is very important. There's at least four roadblocks I want to share with you. In fact, every time we doubt God in one of these four areas, it leads us to sin. I started thinking about this. Someone shared this with me, and I was like, man, that's really, really true. Every time we doubt God in one of these four areas, it always ends up in sin. This is why I believe the Bible says that whatever is not of faith is of sin. If we doubt God in one of these four areas, it will lead us to sin. Number one, if we doubt God's love, if we doubt God's love, if we doubt his wisdom, if we doubt his justice, and if we doubt his power. We say, well, how does that work? You know, a lot of times, um, when we believe that we can't trust God, when, we, when we're doubting God's love, and we're like, man, God has just let us down. We might be in some situation where it's like, man, God, I, I don't think he really loves me. He's let me down. And we end up sinning because we distrust that God still loves us. We distrust that. Or when we distrust that God is wise, like God is telling us, you know what, you need to do this. This is what my law says. Like, look, I don't know if that's, we can end up sinning because we distrust his wisdom. And a lot of times we distrust his justice. Some people say, well, you know what? I can commit this sin and God still loves me. He's not going to do anything about it. I doubt it. He's too loving to do anything about it. You know, I know that, you know, God loves me. And if I sin, it's okay. It's okay if I sin. We end up in presumption because we're doubting God's justice. If you take any one of those four and you doubt God in any one of those four, it either leads to distrust or presumption. And it leads to sin. Those are the roadblocks. The final thing tonight I want to share with you about faith is that faith acts. It works. I want to read a quote to you. I've been reading through a book called Manuscript Releases, Volume 6. Anyone ever, ever read through that? And I can tell you, I just like to read it sometime. It's like, wow, this is just so enjoyable. And I came across this, this quote. Hopefully I can find it. Let me just see here. Here we go. Ellen White says, the arms of Jesus are open to receive you. Will you not come to him? Jesus presents to you the gift of eternal life. Will you receive it? Faith and works go together. And each is dead if alone. Did you catch that? Faith and works go together and each is dead if it's alone. So if you're the type of person who says, well, you know, I'm going to work, I'm going to work, I'm going to try to keep the commandments of God, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, all your works is just dead works. But on the other hand, if you're the type of person who says, you know what, God loves me, God doesn't want me to keep those things, I don't have to obey that, God loves me, you know, you don't have a living faith. Because if you really believe it, then you will obey. And God will give you the power to obey. So she says, each alone is dead. And then she says this, um, not that works will save you. They are the fruit of faith. And living faith will reveal itself in action. In action. I love the story as we close. Um, I think the, the man's name is uh, Charles Blondin. I'm sure you've probably heard that name before. But I used to love to hear his story. He was a tight roper. And he would always, he is famous for tight roping over the Niagara Falls. And I can remember a few years ago, I went to Niagara Falls for the first time, and I just so happened to go on the, the day that they had, they had, or the week, they had had some heavy rains. And boy, that water was, I was scared. I was like, oh boy, I was like holding on to the edge. And I was thinking to myself, how in the world did Charles Blondin have the, 
the, the guts and the boldness to walk across with, over with a tightrope. I think it was like 160 feet in the air. If I, I don't want to exaggerate, but I think that's what they were saying at one point. Um, but he would do all sorts of feats. He would, he would you know, I think I saw one, one where they said he, would, he did like a, some sort of flip up there. And at other times he, um, he, he, walked, on, he walked on the tightrope with, with stilts and stilts, whatever they call those things. All sorts of things. One day he actually cooked an omelet brought a stove out, cooked an omelet, boat comes underneath, and he lets the omelet down uh, in the, in the, to the boat, and someone eats the omelet, right? He, he went up there with ch- all sorts of things, and, and, and he would always come up with something new because the people were always thinking, okay, what is he going to do next? And crowds would come out, and then he would, you know, do something new. Then they was like, he's like, okay, I got to do something to bring the crowds out again. So he would advertise something else, and the crowds would come back out. And this is what he did for quite a bit of time over Niagara Falls. But one day he was trying to come up with an idea. He and his manager like, okay, what can we do? What, what can we do? And he actually came up with an idea of um, taking a wheelbarrow and going across the tightrope. And what he said he would do, he said, you know what? I'm going to ask who wants to hop in. So they had seen all his feats and everything he wanted to do. And so eventually he gets up before the people. He said, you know, he said, uh, how many people believe He said, I'm going to take this wheelbarrow, and I want to put somebody inside. How many people believe that I can get across from one side to the other, from the American side to the Canadian side, with someone in this wheelbarrow? You know what everyone said? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, woo, yeah. Oh, man, we can't wait to see this. And then Charles Blondin asked a very specific question. It was like giving him the pill after after a church service. (laughs) He was like, who would be willing to get into the wheelbarrow? Yes, yay, yay. Not one person. Not one person got in. Someone said, wow. You know, while they were testifying of their faith, while he was asking for someone, he said, do you believe it? Everyone says they believed it. But their works showed that they really did not believe it. Their faith didn't, the fruit of their faith did not follow, their action did not follow what they were professing to believe. And my friends, when I look at that story, that's a lot like us. A lot of us, we're like, well, you know, I believe. Oh, yeah, I believe Jesus died on the cross. Oh, yeah, I believe God can keep us from that sin. Oh, yeah, I believe God can do this and God can do that. But then when God is saying, listen, okay, step out in obedience, do we really believe? I want to share one thing about faith. This is my last thing. How many of you remember the story of Peter? Peter's walking on water. Remember that story? We all familiar with that? You know, Peter, he, as he's there, <clears throat> if he was just to decide to walk in that water, how successful would have Peter have been to walk on that water? Could he have been like, you know what, I'm, a, I'm just going to get a head start, I'm going to run really, really fast, and maybe the speed of running, I can, I can stay afloat. Would that have worked? Could he have been like, you know what, you know, sometimes we do when we, when, you know, sometimes when I'm working on a roof or something, I'll try to step very lightly, make sure I don't break anything. Like, could he have stepped lightly on the water and be like, okay, maybe if I step lightly, I won't fall through. Could that have worked? It was just as impossible for Peter to walk on water, or it's just as impossible, it's just as impossible it is for Peter to walk on water. That's how possible it is or impossible it is for us to, to, to obey God's law. That's how impossible it is. The Bible, Ellen White says, we must fail if we try to do something in our own strength. But what did Peter do? Peter said, Lord, if you have me, help me to come out on the water. And Jesus calls Peter out on the water, and then what did Peter do? He begins to walk. Not in his power, it was in the power of God. And that same power is the power God can give to you and me. When we have faith, Every law that God gives us, those who are struggling with habits, there are habits that we have secretly that we're struggling with, and some of us, we're like, this is impossible. Well, of course it's impossible. It's as impossible as you trying to walk on water. You can't do it. But when we start to believe in the word of God and say, Lord, it's not me, but it's you, God says, look, that thing that's impossible for you is possible with God, and like Peter, we can walk on water, but it's the water of those temptations. But suppose Peter's like, God, if that's really you, let me come out on the water. And then Jesus, or give me power to walk on the water. And Jesus was like, okay, Peter, 
I've given you the power. You can walk in water. What if Peter was like, thank you, Lord. That was all I needed to hear. I'm going to stay right here. Do you think he would have ever walked in water? Faith without works is dead. It's not your works. It's impossible for you to do it. But if you really believe God, act on it. And trust his power for you to live a holy life. Tonight our prayer is a prayer for all of us. All of us are in different points in our life. All of us need maybe a, a, a stronger faith, a strength in our, in our, in our lives. It's not for us to look and say, okay, that person doesn't look like he has faith. That person, oh, no, it's me, it's me, it's me, oh Lord. It's me standing in need of prayer. And tonight our prayer is, Lord, strengthen and increase my faith. Help me to apply these things to my life. Help me to trust that God is, and he is a rewarder for me. Make it personal. Tonight we're going to pray again. And I want to ask that, um, as we did last night, I'm going to close out with a prayer, but if you can pray silently, and once you're done, if you can quietly uh, leave the auditorium, that would be greatly appreciated. But ask those God those specific things. Lord, increase my faith by your grace. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, I thank you for hearing us today. I ask that you would increase our faith. And as my brothers and sisters are praying, I pray that you do something special in their walk so that this year will not be the same as last year. They will find themselves closer on the rounds of Peter's ladder, drawing closer to their Savior. Pray this for myself as well. In Jesus' name. We are so pleased that you could join us for this special event here at Wachita Hills Academy and College. If you've enjoyed this presentation as much as I have, you can go ahead and like, share, and subscribe to this YouTube channel. Also, if you'd like to support making programs such as these, you can find donation information in the description below. Thank you so much again for joining us, and may God richly bless you.